How's it going, Deb? Great, great. Uh, before we get started, Deb, why don't you uh, tell us a little about yourself? Okay, well, uh, let's see here. I've, I've been a mortgage broker and a realtor for uh, 16 years now. Um, I started my career sort of in the stock market, and I, I, I jumped from being a hairdresser into the stock market. I just got a job. Back in those days, there was lots of good jobs, and, and you know, it was easy to, to find work. I, I jumped into the stock market, uh, took, the, took the courses that you needed, um, and I worked in the stock market, hands down the best job I ever had. It was just awesome back in those days because, of, like, there was a trading floor and everything was loosey-goosey. It was lots of fun. There was lots of fun. And I was 22, 23 years old, so it was good times. But um, moving on, I uh, after that, I went into TD Green Line, which is a mortgage or brokerage side, stock broker. But... Uh, <laughs> It was still investments, but it was owned by TD. And then that's how I moved into uh, TD, into financing. And uh, uh, that's a soul-sucking job, I'll have to say, <laughs> working in the bank. But uh, anyways, I, I, decide, I discovered that I like doing mortgages. So I started working towards mortgages, uh, and uh, I took the mortgage broker course, passed that, and I went out on my own because that, that's the only way you could do it. Um, and I did that. I was doing it for about five years. And uh, I was uh, working with a good friend of mine who was a realtor. And, and I just liked it so much. I, I took the real estate course, too, and, and uh, started doing both. And I have done both. The whole, pretty much the whole time, although I don't, I find I don't do it as much uh, the, uh, as I used to. But uh, yeah, I do mortgages and and real estate. That's what I do. Well, good stuff. Um, my uh, I, I don't don't let my appearance fool you. I'm I, I'm I have early onset amnesia even at my age. We we did at one point we talked on the phone, right? Um, we've talked on the phone, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. I, I just I was hoping I didn't get the wrong person. So about like a year, year and a half back, uh, I had a fascinating conversation with you about mortgages. Yep. And even then, you were talking about how you're, you're kind of alarmed by, um, I guess, the poor decisions that people make when it comes to their mortgages. I, <clears throat> I, I might have to correct that it's not poor decisions. Everybody wants to own a house. Um, and and we are just in the atmosphere. When I started in in two thousand and seven, uh, mortgage rates were still pretty low. They were, you know, three three and a half four percent. Um, and and that was in two thousand and seven. Two thousand and eight, we had the big financial crisis. So I was brand new in mortgages, and. Uh, the, it just, the market froze. Kind of like what it's doing right now. But the market froze and you couldn't get a mortgage approved. They, they just wouldn't approve them. They were so, the, the banks, the lenders, everything were so scared. A lot of lenders went out of business at that time. Um, but but people, uh, that, uh, I mean, for a while, that, that, that was around the time when they were creating 40-year uh, amortizations, uh, zero down payment. If you, if you were prepared to pay the, uh, the mortgage insurance fees for, for a zero down payment with a 40-year amortization, you, they had to tack it onto the mortgage and you could just buy it. And so... It was a, a good and bad thing. I did, uh, forty year amortizations are, are not a good thing. Uh, um, they have to bring them back right now because of the situation that people are in. But um, it, you just don't pay enough of the principal off. It's gotta, it's gotta um, 
I think 30, 30 years. I think that they could they could go uh, high ratio and go back into a 30 year mortgage and I don't think it would hurt anybody. But we were getting high ratio, zero down. High ratio means you have less than 20% down, okay? Um, and there was people there was people going in with no money down. If you could afford it, if you could qualify with it, your income, there was people. I don't. I don't think we ever got as bad as the states. The states got rid. Of, they did some really crazy stuff. Um, we've always had like CMHC, Canadian Mortgage Housing um, Corporation. They they insure mortgages. We, there's two. CMHC is federally funded. Uh, there's two more. Uh, uh, Denworth and uh, slipping my mind, but there's two private ones also uh, um, insurers. So, so we have three different places to go. Um, getting back to whether uh, they're doing making crazy decisions. What I mean is, when when you get a client, a lot of times, especially if they're a first time home buyer, they have no clue what they're doing. They're relying 100% on you. They're getting pressure from the realtor to to get the deal done, to get it, uh, uh, you know, approved so that the, and the realtor usually 90% of the time, all they care about is that if they get paid. If, if the deal doesn't go through, they don't get paid. So, um, so yeah, a, a lot of clients are, it's a, it's pressure, it's, um, I guess it's winning because really a lot of people go in and they, I guess being on both sides, I see both sides of the, of the, of the market. And the, this last couple of years has been ugly. It's been ugly because you, you want your client to buy something uh, and they go and there's going to be 10 offers and they're going to have to pay sometimes upwards of a hundred thousand dollars over an already inflated price because uh, for the last couple of years you could throw a dart at the wall and pretty much price it wherever you want and it's going to sell you just look at the last sale price and add ten thousand or however they they were doing it and uh, it would sell because we have no inventory um and they're they're flooding the country with with a lot of people. Um, I'm kind of getting away from from it, but when a client wants wants what they want, they're going to do what they have to do to get it. You can tell them a million times you've over like you had to overpay to get this, um, and and if prices go down or anything happens, you're underwater. You're underwater, and you're going to either have to suck it up and stay where you are until you're until it's caught up, or you're going to lose money. So, um, uh, the the age of flipping that's gone. Nobody flips anymore. You just can't make money on it. Um, although in 2018, 2019. Mobile homes were good. You could buy those, fix them up, and flip them. But it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not really there anymore. It's mostly being pressured into getting something that they don't, uh, and they have no idea. You you can give them. I'll give you the example of variable and fix. We've had very very low rates for a very long time. Fixed rates at you know, I don't know, one, 1 1.89. So at, at one point they went down to one point, I think people were getting mortgages at 1.59. That's really, really low. But a variable was still lower by enough that when you, you could sell it, you could sell them the variable. And the only thing I can say, because people are saying, oh, you know, very ir irresponsible for a broker to to sell a variable when rates were that low? I guess uh, yes and no, because I can only say my myself personally, but I've always given them both sides. I say, this is what a variable does, and this is what the features and negative is about the variable. 
and this is a fix and a fix it is what it is it's it's a low rate it's good you're gonna have it for five years you're not gonna have to worry but uh, and and in the last couple of years there hasn't been a lot of downside on on crime there's been a whole lot of upside but no almost no downside but they still took the variable why All right. probably, probably because uh, if if it didn't really have anything to do with the bank rate going any lower. It couldn't. Um, but uh, I guess it was the flexibility. Um, chances are that if you did sell or do anything, you only had a three-month penalty, whereas a fixed, a fixed uh, rate, when uh, uh, you, it's an interest rate differential or a three-month penalty, whichever is greater. Once again, I have to say, at a very, very low rate, if rates are going up, you're going to hit a three-month penalty. It's not going to be an interest rate differential. The only time you hit interest rate differential is now. Like, people are going to be hitting big interest rate differentials now if they sell or try to get out of their mortgage early or anything like that. Because now they're at, you know, when interest rates are really, really low and you're uh, and they're going up. They don't. The bank doesn't care if you get out. You're going to pay your three month interest, and the bank doesn't care. But when interest rates are really, really high and start dropping, then you're hitting the interest rate differential penalties because they're losing a high interest mortgage, and uh, they're going to replace it with a lower interest mortgage. So that's that's the bank's sort of version of it. All right, so uh, <laughs> I, I have a feeling you're never going to respect me again. I'm going to ask you some really novice questions. So, no, nope, nope, go ahead. I, I, chances are, uh, you know, I might have to go through them. But so, so like, uh, uh, I, I want to get a mortgage for let, let's use round numbers for a million dollar home. Mm -hmm. um, I put down a hundred thousand dollars. What what is that hundred thousand called? The principal. No, that's your down payment. Okay. And then, so that's my down payment. And then the million dollar house, what, is that the principal, the equity, the asset? What do you call it? Um, the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, uh, you're going to get a mortgage and it's going to be secured against the property and it's going to be registered on, on the title. Um, so, so the equity it's equity. Your hundred thousand dollars is equity, but they're going to carve all of the charges. The first of all, a uh, hundred thousand down is is ten percent. So you're a high ratio mortgage. You uh, you probably have to be nine 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 because you have to be under. Otherwise, you have to go. Um, it's uninsurable over a million. See that in in twenty. 20, uh, what did they do? In 2016, they, they redid all the, after this, after the big mortgage um, uh, fallout in 2008 and 9, they re, they've been, every year they do a few more changes to the mortgages. And if you buy something uh, now, uh, you used to be able to refinance right back up to 95% because you can put 5% down on a mortgage. It's called high ratio and, and uh, it's going to be insured. You're going to pay insurance. Um, and uh, the properties were just going up so quickly that uh, people were, were using their, their mortgage like an ATM. They were just refinancing, refinancing every couple of years. It was really, they didn't really have uh, penalties for you to do that if you stayed in this in your in the same mortgage company and just uh, you know all you had to do for us anyways all they had to do was add ten thousand dollars and we get repaid for the whole mortgage so it was just like a free-for-all they were using their mortgages for ATMs and you eating up all of the equity because it kept going back up to 95% so they revamped that and any 
purchase, and it's not a mortgage, it's a purchase over $1 million is now not insurable. And so uh, you, you can't only put 10% down, you have to put 20% down because it's, uh, it's, it's an uninsurable mortgage and uh, um, CMHC won't insure it. So you, ha you have to put 20% down. Uh, but if you buy a house for 999000 you can still fall into the, into the insurable, insurable, and you can, uh, as long as you can insure it. So that means you can put 5% down if you can qualify, but, um, and, and that's the, the, the thing about the low, low rates. You were qualifying for a lot more uh, before these, the rates went up. So it was easy, a lot easier to buy a million dollar house with a five or a 10% down or just under a million. I think they might've moved that up, especially in these areas. I think it's 1.25 now, something like that because, uh, because well, there's not a house around here that's under a million. So um, I think they moved it up. But uh, yeah, so, so um, you can qualify with a really low interest rate and you could buy probably more than what you, uh, what you should. But you also have to remember that rates have been this low for 30 years now. 9404, 14, 24. Yeah, uh, I bought my first house in 1990 well, late 1993, and our interest rate was 6.99, and they've never been higher. They just kept going down since then. So, so really, you know, they've been relatively affordable, and and people just they never thought that they would see this happen again. So they've just been going to the wall with what they can afford, with a nice low interest rate. Uh, you know, it, it, buying, putting 5% down on a $950,000 house, if you can qualify, your payments were, you know, I don't know, maybe $2,500, $3,000. Now those payments are $7,000. Okay. So on that one, I was going to skip ahead to something, but so going back to the $100,000, let us say it's a million dollar home. I put $100,000. I, re I really want to use simple in interest rates. Let's, I don't know, um, 2%. You just pretend that a million dollars is okay to put 100,000 down, 10%. All right. And let's, well, interest rate is 2% is just for math purposes. Is that okay? Yeah. So, so the first month, um, am I paying a first year? It's 2% compound annually. Seven. What? what, what it's two percent of the nine hundred thousand every year. What, what is it? Uh, the way they have, like a mortgage, there's term and amortization. So uh, let's assume, if I'm talking dollars for dollars, because uh, I, I know it's it's hard for you. You just want me to give you like a straight, simple answer, but there's no straight, simple answer anymore, and so. If anybody was listening to this and they're like, what the hell is she talking about? Because because um, if you did 100000 down on a million dollar purchase, it would be called a high ratio. So CMHC gets involved and they, they're going to charge you an insurance fee. And it's, it's not for you, it's for the lender in case you default. Um, um, and so they add that onto your mortgage, but it doesn't affect your debt service. It just, it's just added onto the mortgage. So what you end up doing in, in essentially is you end up putting only about 3% or, uh, okay, I'm using 10% down. You probably end up only putting about 7% down after, the, after all those fees go in there. So uh, your high ratio, and then they, and then you pick a term, and it's anywhere. It can be one year, five year. They have seven. They have ten year terms. Not very many people take seven or ten year. Five years probably the most uh, popular, 
um, because it always has the best rate and it just it just does so uh, when rates are low and uh, a one year is 2.3 and a two a, a two year three year you know it goes out to where a five year is is uh, two percent why would you why would why wouldn't you take the five years and 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 like lock yourself in for five years at that rate versus one year people say okay well but rates might be lower in a year yeah but uh, they might be but they might not be so you know locking yourself five years has just been up a roundabout term high ratio the maximum amortization is 25 years you can't you can't go to a 30 year uh, you know you just can't so uh, you have to qualify now we have a, a GDS and a TDS gross debt total debt so gross is all the housing it's principal interest taxes uh, heat and strata if there's any and then the total debt is that plus all your other debt and so uh, we have to qualify you on on your income you have to fit in those boxes um, and the uh, GDS is maximum maximum 39 percent and TDS is maximum 44 percent but we don't take into consideration your um, like daycare costs or anything groceries we don't take in any of that we just take in the hard debts like credit card loans stuff like that so and yes in the first five years chances are you're, you're not paying a whole lot of principal off however because interest rates have been so low and values have been going up you have been paying you've been paying more um, more principal than interest off right from the beginning and that's uh, you know that's where like you were building the equity in your house much faster when you're when your interest rates are really really low you build the equity in your house much faster I, uh, I, I guess by now the audience realizes I've never gotten a mortgage <laughs> I'm asking these questions, but uh, month to month, you're paying a portion of that goes towards paying off the nine hundred thousand, and a portion of that is the penalty, which we call interest. Uh, well, don't call it a penalty. It's it's interest. It's the cost of financing. A sorry, penalty sorry. Yeah. is a penalty is over and above that. If you discharge that more, if you break your contract, like in year three of a five year term, if you break that's the penalty that you pay and that's over and above all of the interest basically what they're doing is they're making sure that they get their interest no matter what that's so it's not a penalty it's the cost of financing sorry I should have used the word cost you're right <laughs> um, can we can we quickly do the numbers here so if, if I was let's say a uh, hundred down million dollar property and I want to finance it for five years um, can you pick an interest rate and just roughly tell me how much I'd be paying a month a year I can do it if you let me see if I I'll go into my uh, mortgage do you mind if I do that I, will I sure. lose I won't lose you right can you still hear me we'll find out <laughs> okay <laughs> hold on Okay, so I'm going to choose a five-year term, um, monthly payment, 25-year amortization, mortgage amount, 900000 interest rate 2%. Um, okay, so a 900 dollar mortgage uh, with a 25 year am and a two percent interest rate your pay your mortgage payment is 381106 uh, and mortgage balance 
Okay, so um, calculate the amortization. So in uh, year one, in year one, the, the total interest that you pay is uh, $17,670, and the total principal that you would pay is $28,000. I, uh, uh, and that's, like, that's amazing. To, that, that's why people ha have been so happy over the last couple of years. I just, because I want to show you an example of uh, five years with 2%, your, your mortgage payment is 38811 If you took a five year right now at uh, 5.69, your mortgage payment is 5593 so 5600 So, what you're paying off, just hold on here because it didn't print properly. In in on the five point six nine five year term, uh, here's here's the difference. Uh, the interest that you pay in one year is fifty thousand, and the principal you pay is sixteen thousand nine forty. So there's the, there's where we are right now. That's the difference. Back when interest rates were two percent or lower, you were you were paying off a lot of your principal uh, against less interest. And now with these rates up here, you're not paying off a, a, a lot of principal. You're paying off less principal and more interest. And it is on a on a, a, a scale. It, cha it changes by two or three dollars a month. So in your first month, you practically pay nothing in principal, mostly interest, and then a little bit more to principal every month. So it, because it's calculated monthly in advance. On um, the other any balance. Uh, regarding, I believe it's the amortization is the word you use when you spread something out across time. Yeah. So. Um, the, if a house is a million dollars and you amortize it across a hundred months, you're paying ten thousand a month um, towards the house, correct? Uh, just uh, based on a simple interest uh, calculation, uh, uh, possibly, yeah, yeah. I, what I'm trying, what I'm saying is. Um, it doesn't matter what bank you go or at any, it, it's consistent, right? You just take the value of the house and you divide it by the number of months. It's not like, um, it's not at all, it's not a split between the interest rate or anything like that. It, well, it is. Uh, when, when we do a like five-year term, the calculations that we do on the five-year term are, a, it's the 25-year amortization, it's the five-year term, and we assume that everything being equal, you, uh, this payment will cause you to have a zero balance in 25 years. But that's never, it's never consistent because every time you renew, every five years you have to renew. Now, uh, five years from now, you're renewing a new five-year term, but the amortization is 20 years because you've already paid 20 uh, five years of the amortization you've already paid, right? Right. So I'm, I'm thinking of it. Down. Sorry, I'm thinking of it in math mathematics terms. Uh, the amount you in a one year mortgage, the amount you put away every month towards the house is five times more than the amount you put to get away in a five year mortgage. Correct. Say it again. So, um, if I'm putting it in a, in a five-year mortgage, if I'm putting every month, I'm putting $1,000 towards the, the house in a five-year mortgage, in a one-year mortgage, I'd be putting forward, putting $5,000 towards the house, correct? You would never get the same... Uh, I'm not talking about the interest. I'm just talking about the towards the house. talking about a simple interest rate. Yeah. Assume a zero zero percent interest rate. 
zero percent interest. Okay. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I guess it, thinking of it that way. Yes. Um, okay. Um, the other, the next question you, you mentioned uh, for a twenty-five year, I'm just going to call it mortgage. So you get a five-year mortgage, and then at the end, you have to refinance again for five more years. Yeah, you can refinance. You can, you can. It's and it's called just renew. You're not refinancing. You're renewing for another five-year term, or four-year term, or three-year term, whichever you choose to do. Uh, I'm telling you, honest to God, that's why we have our calculators built into the, you just couldn't, you, you can't. I I could pick up my computer, but I'd have to, or my, my cat calculator, but it, it's, it, you know, I'm not fast enough. We don't have enough time for me to calculate out all of this stuff. Although it is, I, there's a financial calculator that does it, but uh, I have a system and I just plug the numbers in and it tells me what I need to hear. So, um, but yeah, uh, uh, every, in, in Canada, because in the U.S. it's different. And so uh, you may be confusing that because in the U.S. you can get terms equal to the amortization. So you can get a 25-year term and a 25-year amortization. In Canada, you can't do that. In Canada, you get a five-year term and a 25-year amortization? And a 25-year. And if you go outside of insurance, insurable, outside of that, you can do a 30-year amortization on a five-year term. So you pay a little bit less interest because, because you're, it's, you're spreading it over 30 years. So let, let's tackle that from the, the customer, the but the, the let, what do you call the the person getting the mortgage? Mortgagee. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think it from that perspective. Why yeah. would anybody say, "Okay, it's going to take me twenty five years to pay this off"? Why don't I just get a five year? Like no one's going to walk away from that five year investment at the end of the five years. What? Why? Why is it not just a twenty five year term? Uh. I, I think that you'd have to, uh, I, I think that they, they, everything that they do, they do for themselves. They don't do it for the client. So um, when you lock yourself into like a 25 year term with a 25 year amortization, that rate is locked in for the whole time. With this one, because rates over 25 years, rates can really move, and they have. Um, um, in Canada, rates traditionally after five years, they just they just want to hold. They want to to renew you into whatever the going rates are. They don't want you locked into a 25 year really low rate. If rates were to move up, they want you to they want you to have to renew. That's that's what's happening right now too. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The conspiracy theorists might be coming out on me, but I uh, there there's you know markets don't shake out. They don't shake out. They're manipulated. The, the interest rates, everything is. It, they're manipulated to in favor of whatever they need it to be. I've known it for years. The stock market, same thing insider trading it, it it's all it's all that way but we just have to work within the uh, the constructs of it we just do can you can you go a little bit are you gonna have to cut that out <laughs> no 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 i, I want to go a little bit deeper on that one so before we do um i want you to explain for me what interest rates are but i'll tell you what i think they are okay um to me, uh, first of all, it's set by the central bank. I don't know if it's by the central bank or the treasury. It's called the overnight rate. I'm assuming there's some something in law that says there's a bill passed that says when this department and the federal government sets the overnight rate, the banks have to abide by it. Is that how it works? Yes, to to a certain degree. Okay, so um, Prime 
and variable rates uh, is set by the central, the Bank of Canada. They have their rate, and then it, there's a, a couple percentages added for the bank rate, okay, the prime rate, and then the, the banks add their portions on to pass it on to the client. So everybody's making money except for the client. Um, and and so a prime the prime rate has a schedule and it's I think it's I'm gonna say nine nine set nine times during the year um, so I think there's two months where you uh, two maybe three months where you get a little bit of a break they don't there's no interest rate change uh, they did it um, October there was no rate in November, but there was in December, and there will be in January. So it's they have the you can look it up and and look up the bank uh, rate schedule, and they'll give you the exact dates of when rates will be announced, and they're either going up or down or they stay the same, and that is uh, that's based on, I guess, economic data. Um, they say that it's a, it's a basket. I'm not an economist, so so uh, it's a basket of products. There's uh, if you re it's got uh, oil and gas, food prices, um, uh, housing prices. It's it's a basket. Um, what they did when they okay. So the last year, these interest rate increases. In my opinion, they they were raised to like the bank. When you talk about the like you said something about the three M, right? M M three. Uh, that um, they're not they're not taking into consideration anything anymore. They're printing money. They're just printing money without any accountability. That's where our danger is. Um, the interest rates have gone up. They say it's because of inflation. They overshot. There's, it's now virtually proven that they overshot by two full percentage points. They didn't have to raise them this high. But they need money to finance all their wars and, and stuff like that. And that's coming off the back of us. So, so that's what I mean about manipulation. They they can package it and, and put it out to the public all pretty, and people are not paying attention. They're, they're, they're really not. They're just, they keep us so busy, uh, so, so we're tired, we're busy, we're scared, we're, you know, we're just trying to stay alive. We don't have time to sit down and read the economic data and, and how it's coming out and what it's doing and where it's going. And so that's, to me, this, this whole thing in the last two years didn't need to go down the way it, it did. It did not need to go down the way it did. And, and it's going to have a, a reverberating effect. And they, they, now they're saying interest rates are going to fall really fast. Will they? Maybe, maybe not. Will they ever go back to where they were? Maybe, maybe not. You know, we have no idea. We have no idea. Um, why did they let it go this low in the first place? You know, I, a couple of years ago, crime started to go up. And, and uh, in my opinion, they needed people to go into fixed rates because the economy was unstable. And if you're in fixed rates, if, if everybody's in fixed rates, they, they have a, a little bit of an opportunity to adjust without uh, unforeseeables, you know, happening. So crime started to go up, forced every, a lot of people into fixed rates, not as many as they probably hoped to see. But um, and then and then prime started to drop to me you because i watch the market constantly i can see usually when prime is going up and when it's gonna when it's gonna start to come down 
and the way I, I judge it is uh, we always have five-year variables. Uh, we have prime minus 0.9, so almost a full percentage off of prime on, the, on a variable rate mortgage. When they start to, uh, to bring that in, when they start to reduce it to prime minus 8 or prime minus 7.5, to me, that's an indication that prime itself is going to go down. And they're, they're, so their spread is going to be too, it's going to be too big for them. So they start to bring in the, the, the discount. When, when they put the, the discount out really, really far, it's because prime is usually going to go up. That's, I mean, it's, it's just simple mathematics and it's, it's pretty much worked every single time that I, uh, I predict it. Um, but, I, you know, when, when we're discussing mortgages with a client, I, I always give them both sides and I say to them, this is what it is. And, and you, have to, you have to let them choose. And if they say, what would you do? I hate that because, uh, you know, like I'm in a variable right now, I'm, I'm riding it out, gritting my teeth. But, and, and right now I, would, I wouldn't go into a fix at this moment right now, the rates are falling. And if you lock yourself into a five-year fixed up high like this, you're going to have a huge penalty to get out. Whereas if you're in prime, you might have to eat it a little bit higher rate right now. But if it starts to come down, you're going to get the benefit of it. And it's right on your mortgage. It's not like you have to renew or do anything. It's immediate. Prime goes down 25 basis points. Your mortgage payment can go down, or it can stay the same, but more goes to principal instead of interest. Um, so, so regarding the penalty, um, they they want to discourage people when they see the interest rate is lower from from getting out of their mortgage and then re re re, re um, <laughs> negotiating a new mortgage. So that's why you have like a, for example, three month penalty if you do that. Correct. Uh, well, they, you're going to have a penalty regardless of rates going up or down. When rates are dropping, um, they want to, to discourage you from, from discharging your high interest rate one, right? right? So when rates are going down and people want to get, to get rid of this 5% and, and uh, put it into, say, like a, a 3%, they're going to pay an interest rate differential because the bank is, is losing that 5% mortgage and, and getting a 3%. So they're, they're getting 2% less. When interest rates are going up, all you're going to get is a three-month interest rate penalty because they, they don't care. If you're going from, nobody is, I'll tell you, nobody is discharging their mortgage early right now unless they have to and they've had to sell or whatever. If you got 1.89 right now and you still got two years left on your mortgage, you're not discharging your mortgage. <laughs> so no if, I heard you, if I heard you correctly, you said that if, you, if you're locked into a low interest rate and you try to get out on a high interest rate, they'll let you off with a three-month penalty. But if it's the other way around, they're really going to charge you much more. Yeah, because yeah. they're losing the high interest rate and going into a lower interest rate, right? So that's called an interest rate differential and they hit you. I've seen penalties of $45,000, you know, honestly. Um, when after 2008, when the interest rates really started to come down, there were some people that were saying, hey, I want this really good rate. They couldn't do it because their penalty was so big that it, it, it didn't make sense you you ate all the equity. You you you. Why would you do it? it? It doesn't make sense. So I think you answered one of my questions. I always wondered how it was that if the value of your house goes up, how it impacts your mortgage. But it sounds like you're saying in Canada you renegotiate every five years. Uh, yeah, yeah. You have to renew your term, and uh, you don't really have a choice. The only thing you can do, depending on where rates are, if, if rates are 
they're all pretty much equal. Every once in a while, somebody has a special. And if you have to happen to be needing to renew at the time that there's a really great special and you phone me up and say, I have to renew, you know, and I, what, what rates do you have? And I see a really great special. Then I'm going to say, well, look, I can get you this. It's, it's you know, point, point 0.15 or 20 basis points better than what your bank is offering. And, and the bank will always do this. The bank always sends the renewal at the posted rates, which are horrendous. Okay? And if you're stupid enough to just look at it and go, geez, and you sign it up, you send it back to them, they just got you. And they didn't even have to do any work. And the banks are famous for it. But if you go, I don't think rates should be that high. I'm pretty sure I saw somebody say or my friend told me that uh, they got 3%. And here they're offering me 5.5%. So you phone up the bank and you say, what's this all about? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, we can get you. And they immediately discount it to what broker discounts are. But if, if they're like, and so they, they, you're like, okay, good. And you sign up. We probably could have negotiated a little bit better a price. We might've been able to find a little bit better of a rate, but they got you. You signed up because they just slashed it by 2%. Okay. And it makes you feel good. Your bank's doing the best for you. Not really, but that's the way it is. And then if you sell in your five year term, Say in year three, you have to sell and you're, so now you're breaking your contract. And, and so the interest rate differential, how that goes is the bank doesn't calculate your penalty off of the rate that they gave you. They say to you, we gave you 2.5 off of the posted rate. The posted rate at that time was five and a half. And so we're going to calculate your penalty at the five and a half rate. That's what the bank does to you. Oh, Lord. And, um, and yeah, geez. yeah, it's true. So, so usually because banks have gotten a little bit more com competitive with mortgage brokers, all rates are pretty similar. And sometimes the banks just knock it right out of the, the door. You can't even... You can't even compete because they they have such an excellent rate. So so the only thing that you can do at, at that point is explain to them uh, what you know, like uh, the service that we provide, and then the and our penalties and our pre like the features of the mortgage because so, every mortgage has different features, you know can pay back 20% or 15% or 10%. It all depends, right? So so that's about the only time that we can do it. But for the most part, we can beat the banks just by telling the client about what their penalties would be if they had to get out. And, and some are like, oh, I'm never selling anyways. But on average, uh, most, uh, I'd say, 70% of Canadians take a five-year term and do a change in three years. Either sell their house for a bigger one because of the because the market's just been fantastic, right? You can afford you can afford it. Why not? Interest rates just went down. Why sell your house? It's going up like crazy. Sell your house. You've got another huge down payment, and you qualify for a bigger mortgage and a bigger house. Um, I was at the, uh, a couple of years back, I was at the bank, um, was opening up a new commercial account and the, uh, the bank manager, she asked me, she's like, you know, would you like to read the contract? And I, I wanted to pretend like I was smart. I'm like, definitely. She gives me this big stack of papers. I got through like the first three and I was like, you know what, I'll just sign it. These, um, people who sign these mortgages, how aware are they of all of these pitfalls? Uh, do, do they listen to you or do they just get this glazed look on their face? That's it, exactly. Uh, most, I, I won't say all, but I'd say a good portion of them just like, yeah, 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 give it to me. Just, you know, I'm signing my life away anyways. Just give it to me, you know. Um, there are, like, we have, like, super, super duper uh, points, points that we point out to them when, when they're signing the mortgage. 
that stuff that uh, could get lost in the, the 50 pages of the of the standard mortgage terms because that they are about 50 pages long and you could get lost in them. We have certain things that we make them look at. Uh, some mortgage brokers even make the person sign that they actually saw it because they didn't. And chances are when, it, if, if called on it, they'll be like, you didn't tell me that. And you'll have to pull up the paper and say, here's your signature right here, sir. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of a lot of it is, like I said, it's pressure, it's it's um, uh, winning. I, I don't know what it is, but you know, um, I, I don't want to appear virtuous, but I have always said to my clients, you know, the, the housing prices are high. They're, they're probably, well, I know for a fact they are overpriced. People say, oh, you can't say that. The, the market shakes out. They're overpriced, you know. And uh, and then you say to them, and you're going to have to, there's going to be 10 offers on this place. So if you want this place, if you really want, you have to put your best foot forward. You have to take all of your thinking and throw it out the window. You don't, don't think about, well, I'll go in at a full price offer. Uh, you don't do that. You say, how bad do I want this house? And you, uh, you know, like you're qualified up to 1.2 million and you're going to pay a million for this one. Are you prepared to, to do what it takes to get it? And that's all you can say to them because there's going to be somebody. There's, you know, 10 offers. They think realtors are making money head, hand over head, heel. No. Ten offers, only one's winning. There's only one winning, and all the other nine realtors have to go back with their clients to the drawing board and start looking at other places again and doing the same thing over. And sometimes you can write ten contracts for the for your clients and not win any of them. Because because they either they can't go to where they, they're gonna need to go. So there's, yes, definitely you want, always want them to participate. You don't want to discourage them from participating, but you, you just know inside that they won't get it because they didn't go enough, right? And if they do get it, chances are they overpaid. <laughs> uh, the joys of living in Canada. Well, the, uh, I mean, it, and it's, it's not all everywhere either. You know, I, uh, in 2022, I... I took a job as an underwriter with Merrick's, just a financial, uh, and I worked for them, and I wrote, underwrote mortgages in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and and some of the, I actually enjoyed that. They're, those are beautiful mortgages. But, you know, the house is, is $110,000, and it's a nice house, and they have 5% down, and their income is, you know, sixty thousand a year, just a modest income with a five percent down payment, at two, buying a modest house, and they're qualifying. You know, it, it's it's a, a really happy moment. But that's up in northern Saskatchewan, where it gets to minus fifty below, and you know, most people don't want to live. But yeah, you, you, there there was some beautiful mortgages in in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, even Alberta. You know, uh, last year Alberta's getting expensive now, but last year there were some great mortgages. Um, I had a question lined up, <laughs> and I I already forgot it. Um, going back to the other question I had about um. So the, the price, if your price of your home doubles in the five years, when you go to renew, you're paying a hell of a lot more, right? No. Nope. Oh, you, you're, you can, they'll honor the previous value of the home? No, you, you're not, it's not based on the value. It's based on the outstanding mortgage amount. So if you pay 500,000 for a house and it goes up to 1 million, and you have a five-year term, and at the at, at the end of that, that five-year term, you're you've paid off fifty thousand, and your mortgage is four hundred and fifty thousand. Your uh, 
all that does is it puts you in a really low loan to value and allows you to um, uh, look for better rates actually. But yeah, you don't, they don't value it. They don't take it off of your, off of the value of your house. That's all yours. Well, what I meant was um, if you, if you put down a hundred thousand dollars for a million dollar home, uh, amortized over 25 years, if that was a 25 year term and the price of the house jumped from a million to 10 million, you'd be laughing all the way to the bank. But, but if it's five year terms, when you go to renew the value of what was one, 1 million, you had 900,000 left to pay all of a sudden it's, it's your nine. Yeah. It's a $10 million home. Uh, am I missing something? Yeah. It, the, even if it, even if it goes under, like say, because we're talking always about prices doubling. Yeah. You're just sitting pretty when your price double. I, I saw that question. You said negatively, uh, negatively affect your uh, price of going up negatively impact you. Your prices going up won't negatively impact you. The prices going up, the value of the house going up is not going to negatively affect you. Prices going dropping below. If you if you paid a million and you put a hundred thousand down, and you're uh, you have a nine hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and in five years you owe eight hundred and fifty, and the house is only worth eight hundred. You're underwater on the mortgage. Okay, I, I see where I'm making the mistake. The um, the bank at the outset of the first five year term gives you the full mortgage or the loan of nine hundred thousand. However, you have to renew every five years to to get sort of a portion of that 900,000. Well, you don't really, you don't really get a portion of it. You, it, it just goes, it builds equity, right? As long as you keep the mortgage in place and keep renewing and make your mortgage payments. And if the mortgage rates are going up, like uh, using the double is, is maybe a little bit, uh, you know, ambitious, but uh, you know, things have been going up year over year so that's why when they lend money they haven't been too worried now they are it's a little bit different because they 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 put the brakes on on how's like the value um by putting high interest rates by uh, uh, you know making it unaffordable and even though uh that has that slowed the market that real estate market down enough that houses are actually sitting on the market without not moving and um uh but that doesn't mean that the values are dropping as soon as interest rates drop start dropping you watch it's going to start it's going to take off again i've got two listings right now uh one of them i've already had two offers the sellers have just flat out declined the the second offer we were only twenty two thousand dollars apart on an over million one million dollar purchase price. They said no. They said we're we're prepared to wait. The market's going to change in January February. There it it's a fifty fifty. It could they could start going down, but they're prepared to bet that the market's going to either just pick back up because we're we're in a crunch right now. There's there's. Housing might be unaffordable, but nobody has anywhere to live either. So they, you know, uh, if you can buy, people are buying still. So, uh, yeah, no, if, if prices were to drop, then you negatively impact and, and you're, uh, uh, you might be underwater. But the bank cannot, um, they cannot decline to give you another mortgage unless you've missed a mortgage payment or done something wrong. Um, so, so what, what happens when you're up for renewal, if you've been to a mortgage broker, they come back and they say, I, I've got my renewal papers because all mortgage companies, doesn't matter where we place you, will send you renewal papers. And so I say, okay, well, what's, what's the rate? What rate are they offering you? 
may tell you and you're like, okay, um, do you want me to go and see if I can find a better rate? And they say, sure. And I'll go out and I'll see if I can find a better rate. But the thing is, is it has to be enough of a rate to make it worth their while to move because it's a whole new qualification to bring them over and they don't need to. They're qualified and the bank can't take that away. Unless they've done something wrong, the bank cannot offer to not remortgage. So, okay. so if you're underwater, if you're, you know, you're not, obviously you're not going to move your mortgage. You're just going to stay where you are. You're going to sign the papers. Chances are the bank's going to, you know, do a little dig and they're not going to get, even if you say to them, ah, can you do better than that? They're going to say, no, no, and you can't move. So suck it up, buttercup. That's, that's where it is. But if it's, you know, um, if you've done something wrong, they may ask you to move. They might say, we don't want to renew you. And then you have to go out and find. And that's not a good situation to be in. So you don't want to be missing any mortgage payments or anything. If you got to miss a payment, miss your car payment, miss your credit card payment, don't miss your mortgage payment. You know, it, it just in the end, you can get caught up on your credit card. They might even take your credit card away from you and close it on you. Then, then you can just, you know, but, but you don't want to lose your house. And you don't ever want to go into foreclosure on a mortgage because, because it's going to be on your credit. And it's, it's very, very hard. Once you've gone into foreclosure on a mortgage, it's really hard to get another mortgage. You have to have a lot of down payment. You have to, there has to be a lot of things line up for you after, after you've had a foreclosure. I remember what question I was going to ask you. Uh, why do you think property, let me tee this up actually. Uh, I was looking into the, the price of housing in Canada and I traced it back to 2001 and I looked at, I looked at immigration, I looked at income, natural growth. Uh, I think I looked at those three and oh, GDP, income per capita. None of them changed. The only thing that changed was the M3 money supply. I'm guessing the interest rate was low, or maybe it was money from foreign offshore money. But why do you think the housing prices have just gone up astronomically? So M3, when you, t when you talk about that, what we had uh, an infiltration of investment and not not the good kind of investment. Uh, we had people buying and parking their, just to park their money. And it, was, it wasn't helping anybody here in Canada. <clears throat> we, we have a shortage. Now, uh, prior to about two years ago, a lot of even the, the condos, the stratas, there was no rentals allowed. So even if you bought a place, and you didn't come over, <laughs> like some some places haven't seen a, a human in them for two, three, four years. And because you couldn't rent, that there's just they sit empty when people are screaming for houses. So, so they they changed the rental uh, um, uh, rules in Strata, and now you have you it's rentals are allowed. You just are allowed you can't say no rentals a lot of people a lot of the stratas <clears throat> went from and they and they reduced the age to you can't say lit uh, you know 45 and up or adult orientated you can't say any of that anymore um, if somebody wants to come in and buy a one-bedroom condo and they have they've got new rules where you know it's uh, only a, a one bedroom can only have two occupants in it. So, you know, you can't come in and have three kids and, and have them, you know, set up in bunk beds in the living room. You can't do that anymore. They will fine you and make you move. But as for um, like rentals are allowed now, um, um, age restrictions, no, unless it's 55 over. And a lot of buildings that were already on the verge of you know, uh, adult orientated, you know, don't want kids. They quickly change their strata to 55 plus. Now, anybody who's in there that isn't 55 is grandfathered 
but anybody coming in in the near in the next round it has to be 55 plus um so so yeah i think the absolute flooding of uh immigrants illegal immigrants refugees whatever you want to call them that absolute flooding of the of allowing them to come in combined with housing uh shortages and and also unreal um restrictions for developers and uh, like it's it's not a favorable atmosphere right now for anybody to build and and now i'm going to go off into a little bit of a tangent because um in my opinion it's not a favorable atmosphere right now because there, there's such a push on building low income rentals okay and low income rentals are not owned by anybody but the government that's oh that that's code i i didn't put that together so so um there's there's no like uh the restrictions the rules and, and and regulations to to develop a condo that you're going to put up for sale and they're still coming but they're really it's hard and it, it takes a long time and you have to change the zoning and and you know there's one place in Nanaimo I don't know if you saw it recently on the news or if you follow uh um what's his name from from the island he just became a conservative in the conservative party Aaron Gunn Oh yeah. yeah. Follow Aaron. He he does a lot of stuff about uh, you know uh, the rules and regulations that developers have to jump through are, is are like horrendous. There's no incentive for them to and now with interest rates going up there's not even that that you know they used to get a better interest rate well a better interest rate when interest rates are high is not a good interest rate that's all there is to it. um the cost the cost of building the cost of supplies everything has gone up to the point where it's being out outpriced to what they can actually sell the units for and to me that's on purpose too they they are building they're, they're hardly building any condos that are being for sale anymore or townhouses or anything they're it's all go all their efforts are going towards um low income rentals and let me add they're not low income you know a, a one bedroom at at 2500 or 2800 is not low income so what's happening they're being subsidized so on top of not having affordable rentals for my son to move out and find himself a one bedroom apartment impossible but somebody coming in uh you know from another country they're going to get yeah. subsidized on their income and then they're going to get subsidized on their rent and and we're paying for it we're paying for it this way we're paying for it that way we're paying for it every which way our taxes are going up and that's to pay for the 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 subsidies that are for the low income because they're calling it low income housing but it isn't you know it just isn't i always tell people like i i see i see what the government's doing so so it's not it doesn't always have to be a conspiracy the government the government they don't have to come into a meeting and say all right guys we we're going to make an executive decision today we're going to crush the citizenry of canada and we're going to steal their property like they don't have to do that but they just think all right we're the government and here's a great idea why don't we have subsidized housing and we'll take it over and oh by the way we're the government we don't need all this red tape but you peasants you know you continue with your red tape yeah. so so government's just getting bigger and bigger and i did a, a podcast yesterday with another gentleman and i told him it's not just that this is evil they're very smart about how they're doing it they're 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 um separating the decision making from the cost. So the example I gave is they're centralizing land planning at the provincial level and they'll say, you know, this x amount of new towers. Okay, those new towers are going to need utilities like sewage. 
and who's going to pay for those utilities? It's the local people. Or even if it's not the local people through property taxes, just you're pissed off that this tower is going up, but the decision is being made way over there in Victoria. Nobody asked you. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, that, that was another thing that they don't, they don't, they no longer say, you know, let's have a meeting and discuss how you want your community to move. Um, and everything is kind of, it's, it's starting to become clear and it's moving together. The reason that they want urbanization, the reason that they want 15 minute cities and densification, um, as you pack more and more people together, the decisions seem like they appear like they're godlike, the problems. They're impossible to solve, so you need government to solve them, and everyone just feels little. Yep. So. Yep. It's 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 the old, don't trust. You know, hello, I'm the government. I'm here to help you. They're not here to help you. They're they're never. They're only there to help themselves. Government is too big now, and it's bloated, and uh, and and you know it, what's even worse is it used to be. What we were bloated with was, was uh, you know, like committees to for like the beautification of parks or you know stuff that you could say, come on, we don't need to spend that money. But now, you know where the where all of the stuff is going to, and it's going to the division of of, of us as humans. It's going to special uh, special interest groups like. I'm sorry to say it, but LGBTQ, that's a, you know, it's, it's separating people. I, I, I keep saying I'm not the sum total of one thing that I speak about. I have many, many different virtues and ideas and, you know, and you might hate the thought that I have here. But we might agree on three other thoughts, but we're being kept separate. We're being separated. Uh, there, there's a really good video that I found on the internet one time. It's a it's a a, a square, a big square, and they they put people into it, and then they divide it down the middle, and they say, okay, so we want black people here and white people here. And then they divide it again, and they say, uh, we want people who speak French and people who speak English. This is just an example. It could be anything. And all of a sudden, some black people have to go into the English, but they can't because they've been separated by color, right? Then they say, we're going to, now we want, uh, like, Christians and Muslims. And they, they've added another block for you to step into that, you know, e either you're stepping into it and you're choosing to step into that block because now you've left your white block and you've left your English speaking block and, you, and you're over in the, the Muslim block or whatever. You, you can never, ever win because everybody has a whole bunch of different aspects of their life and, and um it's what makes us it's what makes us unique it's what makes us beautiful and it's what makes uh us human but yet they are they're pigeonholing us and forcing us to make choice that we don't want to make and they're doing it and and a government or a, a people divided they can't stand up to the government but if we all got together and said, "There's here's one thing that we can agree on. Imagine what we could do." That's that's the only way I can see it because uh, we we are we're headed towards some some big disasters and yeah, we kind of got off the topic of housing. No, it's that's, okay. Uh, that's kind of the way I see it. Is is we're we we. It's rules and regulations. It's the flooding of, of too many people. I think we need a moratorium on on immigration. I, I mean, completely, until we can sort the messes that we have out at home here. I, I'm not saying that I'm against immigration. God, I, I, you know, I'm not. But we need to stop this. And we also we also have to look at 
uh, if you're coming here, you have to, like you're allowed to keep your religion or your whatever at, in your house and stuff like that, but um, you gotta assimilate. If, if I move to India, I can't expect all of, you know, the town that I live in to put up Christmas lights and do all of that stuff and celebrate Santa Claus. I can't expect it. They don't do it over there. I, I, I should not be able to demand it. I, they wouldn't. They wouldn't put up with it. Same with, uh, you know, um, you, you can't even buy houses over in China. You can't. If you're not a natural born Chinese yeah, person. Yeah, a lot of places are like that. If you're not a citizen, you can't buy land. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, on, on that issue, sorry. Uh, I came here in, in 89, and I was thinking about this. In grade two, um, I was, it was me and another girl. We were the only Iranians in, in our class. And I think in the entire school of maybe 500 students, there, there was like five of us that were Iranian. And my ESL teacher, she forbid me from talking or hanging around with the other Iranians because she wanted me to integrate with, with uh, my own classmates, you know, get along, assimilate. I, if you did that today, I, like the UN would probably make a stink about it, about, you know, right. national right. races. Come in and, and take down the school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's true. It's true. Like, like we're better as people that assimilate than, than to keep to ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with like <clears throat> keeping to your, you, you know, like we have pockets of, of Indian and pockets of, of, you know, Filipino because they do tend to gravitate together. Mexicans, people stay, you know, as a group, they, they have their own little groups. Uh, I'm not saying that that's, that's, what we we should discourage i'm saying that we should not like right now these protests no actually fuck no there should be no those protests should not be allowed right now i i don't care um this is not israel and and the gaza strip this is canada and what they're doing right now the hatred that's out there i i just well i won't even get involved i don't even talk about it on the internet or and that's that's quite a thing for me because i'm usually pretty outspoken but i'm not touching it with a 10-foot pole first of all i don't know a lot about it but i do know that that the government should not be allowing this and they shouldn't have allow, allowed it for ukraine either i don't care what anybody says that's i am um, I, I've actually pissed off a lot of people, and I, I try not to say this around other Iranians, but I support Israel on, on selfish grounds because I think the reason so, – so, so all of these pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protests, I think it, it's a symptom of a far larger problem on the left where they hate national sovereignty and they love globalism, uh, United Nations, International Criminal Court. And the reason that the International Criminal Court and the UN have been gunning – uh, for Israel since, I don't know, 2009, is because Israel is it's a sovereign nation. It has to be because it's con they're constant assault. Now, you could blame Israel because they stole land or whatever, but they're always at war, <laughs> so they have to defend their own borders, and the and UN's coming in and saying, no, 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 you need my permission, and Israel's like, you know, F off. Yeah. So in that respect, I, I support Israel because I oppose the UN. Um, but these people protesting in support of Hamas I'm like, 1,400 people got slaughtered. Like, if, if I'm in Vancouver. If 1,400 people died here, it would take us a decade to get over that. It would be catastrophic. That's right. It, and, and but, but then we have to go back into what do we know about this? Like, we, it's, it's been virtually proven that Netanyahu knew this. He knew it was going to happen because, and, and he wanted it to happen so that we could get to war because they want the, the waterway, um, the Suez Canal and all that kind of stuff. They want the waterways up there. And so, uh, like we know that Iran 
is uh, uh, funds Hamas. We know that. Uh, it's yeah. yeah <laughs> so, definitely. <laughs> Um, and and but but uh, they are a terrorist group. They're not a good group. They're not. They're not there to sit. The people of Gaza and most of them are Palestinians that support Hamas. So you can you can say whatever you want, but they are supporting a terrorist group, and um, and they they're they're saying that they want all all Jews dead. Personally, I don't understand the, 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 the problem with that. Like, Jews, people, we're just people. So I never, I never do understand that. I don't look at somebody and go, he's Jewish? Oh, God, I hate him. You know, I just don't do that. But people do, I guess. Because look at the hate. It's vitriol right now. And... And, and these people that are fighting for it, they don't even know. You know this LGBTQ for Hamas? Yeah, okay. Let's let's just ship you over there and, you know, they're going to throw you off a building. That's what they're going to do to you. So, so yeah, it's, it's not a... They... I feel like this is, is controlled opposition. I feel like it's, it's all being... George Soros is sending people up from the from Guatemala and Ecuador and all that. He's paying. The, he's flying people over to Mexico to come across the U, the open, wide open U.S. border, and they're they are terrorists. They, and they're from many different countries: Africa, Iran, Iraq, all A Afghanistan. They're all coming in. These, these people are sleepers. I don't care what anybody says. They're going to wait 10 years, and then they're going to attack. I think uh, we've, we've reached a peak clown world uh, territory where nothing makes sense today. The, the Biden administration, they threatened to take Texas to court if they don't stop stopping the, the illegal immigrants. <laughs> So if Texas keeps uh, detaining the illegals, for, the Biden's going to take them to court. And this is this is so far removed from uh, abdication of presidential duty where he has to enforce the laws. Now he's coming in and he's preventing other people to enforce the law that he wasn't enforcing. I know. He's not and, running anything anyways. He That guy is not running anything. The, he's He is... He's a vegetable. He's a vegetable. Yeah, he is. He is. And even before he became a vegetable, he was just dumb. He's been dumb. You can listen to him talk from, from in in his plagiarized speeches. He's he's he tells stories like crazy. He's dumb, and he doesn't care because the only place that he's smart is he knows how to be corrupt. And he knows how to make money, and that's all he cares about. He's yeah, got the, the, in every every direction, and uh, and he had a good, pretty good, good gig going for the last ten years, and he's been caught. But you know what? I there's enough there's enough corruption on the other side to let it continue, and not and say, oh, we don't have evidence or. We can't do anything. Bullshit! You can't do anything. You can do something when you know that he's that that your president of the United States is that corrupt. You sure can do something. We can't in Canada, but they can. And uh, he, um, uh, uh, but that we have enough people on the on the right, the rhinos, that are happy to allow the Democrats to do all the dirty work and they just get their hands, their, you know, their pockets are being lined left, right, and center, and they're happy and they can continue to blame the Democrats. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's both sides, which is really, really sad to say. I, I you know, nobody's coming to save us. That's, that's one thing no. we for whatever, civil war, whatever it is, but there, you know, even even here in Canada, you know, I I like well, I have to, 
Pierre is personable. He's he's he seemed like, but he's over the past couple of months he's changed. Have you noticed that? He's not that meek little guy, and <laughs> quiet. You know, he's changed. His image has changed. He's he's you know, they they're trying to to put him out to be a, a mini Trump. Personally, if he's a mini Trump, he's got my vote. That's all I. <laughs> Because if I was in the States, I would vote for Trump any day. And will he save the world? Maybe not. Maybe not. But I think, I think, and he's been saying it for years, unless he's been controlled up for years, he's been saying, I love America. I just think that, you know, if I was president, I would do this, this, and this, and America, I would make America great again. And he's been saying for years that America's turned into a shithole. And uh, he says he can fix it. He's only got yeah, one we'll more see time. what happens. I think they're terrified for 2024. Um, after what happened in 2020, I don't, I just don't see how Trump can, maybe I want, I'm being pessimistic so I don't get fooled again, but I, I don't think they're going to throw him in jail. I don't think they're going to assassinate him. That's, that's extreme. But mm. somehow they have to prevent him. Uh, the ballot, mail-in ballots, maybe uh, they, that won't work this time, but they'll, they'll find some way. They're saying that, that it's like like you buckle up. That's what they're saying. And I believe it because I think they're gonna they're, they're gonna try and not even have an election. They're gonna try and make it so that there's not an election. Zelensky did it. There he's he, he won't let elections happen right now. There sh there should have been an election and he won't let it happen. Well Ukraine is a I don't wanna be rude, but Ukraine is a different country it's a whole different planet over there right now but america it's a lot harder like you would i don't think they can outright cancel the elections they would have to declare an emergency and nationalize the elections something like that yeah so and that's, that's what they're going to do there's going to be another emergency another it, i don't know if it's going to be war or another pandemic or whatever but you know like why not throw a pandemic in there the who's got to get their their you know fingers into the pot too personally it's clear as a bell to me uh, how things need to go but i'm not running the country so um and and i've learned too that i always used to think that all these the senators and the uh, house members and all that kind of stuff were so educated they're not they're no. um i could i could run for the U.S. in the U.S. government and do as good a job. And you know how I know? Because Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, they are just, Marjorie Taylor Greene just didn't like, she was trying to get some silly thing changed in, a, in the town that she lives in. And look where she is now, and she's as honest as the day is long. I you know might not like her. She, she, she's not everybody's cup of tea. She's, she can be a little bit, you know, brash, I guess you could say, but, but she says the truth. She, she calls it as she sees it. She's, you know, and she's for you. You know what woman in politics I absolutely adore? Do you know Governor Christy Nome? Yep. So her story is fascinating. Her father, she, you know, she had a strong father figure and they had a ranch and her father passed away tragically. So she had to come back and manage the ranch. So while she's grieving and, and trying to get, keep the family afloat, she gets hit with a massive IRS death tax. You know, like that's, that is, that's very difficult to deal with. So she got angry. She started getting involved and then she ran for Congress and now she's governor. Yeah. And like, I'll never forget. She came on Fox News and they asked her maybe like five times, like, would you consider running for president? Would you? And then she said, listen, anybody that wakes up and the first thing and the last thing they think about is how to run for president, you probably don't want them running for president. Like, she is a solid, solid human being. Yeah. And I think, uh, like, uh, yes, I agree with you. And I've listened to her and and uh, and she's she's well spoken too. she doesn't, you know go off on you know tangents or anything like that mtg I, f I feel the same way about her she's a solid she's a solid person she she wanted to change something and all of a sudden she's a she's in the congress you know and and uh 
um, doing stuff. Lauren Bobert, Lauren Ber Lauren Bobert. Um, I don't know how she managed to get in. Probably something similar, but uh, I mean, geez, she's 30, 38 and she's a grandma already. Really? Four kids. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And and she's gone through a divorce publicly in the public because they just divorced her and her husband publicly while she was in in the Senate or House or whatever wherever she is. So yeah, she's uh, you know we need some we need some fresh blood. There's no doubt that we need to get rid of the Mitch McConnells and and Lindsey Graham's because they they're like like they're just at the point of. Of lining their pockets now. <coughs> How Nancy Pelosi is still in there is like beyond me. I don't know how she's still in. Well, well, I mean, who was the senator, Diane Feinstein, the one that recently passed away? Yeah, like she was like a hundred. She was a fossil, poor thing, when she passed. Yeah, and she couldn't. Um, she had to be wheeled in, and they had to tell her how to vote. Say yes, say yes, say no. Yeah, I, I remember that. Well, I mean, if you really want to talk about people that are in a persistent vegetative state, we, we, we have to mention, um, who, who, who's that Frankenstein guy? The guy who had a stroke and Fetterman? Fetterman, the guy can't talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? The guy can't talk. They put a teleprompter in front of him. He can't read it. They put him in, give him an earpiece. He can't re repeat what they I tell him. him lately? Either they no. switched that guy out, or he, but he's coming back. And he said some pretty intelligent stuff. Even even I, my mouth fell open and I thought, oh my God, like, I don't know what's going on. We know that, uh, well, I'm pretty sure that they have switch outs and, and uh, you know, uh, Biden. I heard that Biden, the real Biden is dead. But then that's like, that's my like deep rabbit hole stuff. And they apparently he died, and and they had a funeral for him and everything. And so this is not this is not really Joe Biden. I, I could you imagine the the president dies and that nobody notices for two years because <laughs> he never did anything. He's uh, yeah he's he's a uh, I don't know he's a vegetable this guy. It, and I keep saying to myself, he can't, if, if he actually died, you, why would they show such stupidity? Like, carry on the stupidity. Why don't they just, like, improve him even 5% and just let him, you know, do whatever? I think um, we don't give uh, Joe Biden enough credit. In some ways, he's the smartest man alive because he with with Kamala Harris, he has a 100 percent like uh, what do they call it? Assassination insurance. They'll never take him out because that woman, she, she's unelectable. She is horrible. Um, I, I, I can't even believe like I, you know, they kept. Um, uh, what was another? Well, they kept Joe Biden in the background at, with Obama because Joe's a dumb dumb and, and they, he said stupid things. So they kept him away as far away as they could while, while Obama was the president. And now they got, they put the guy in as president and got someone even dumber to, to be vice. I, I just, I don't, I don't even get it. So in 20 years, if Kamala Harris is president, Fetterman's going to be vice president. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, you know what? It's, this clown world is just crazy enough. I could see it. I think that they're going to drop Michelle, Mike, Obama. Mike. I, I just, um, I feel like it's a, it's a little bit late for that. Like even Newsom, I don't know what's going on because... If they were going to make a play, they should have done it by now. But maybe they're waiting for this um, bribery thing through the Congress so that they can ask Joe to step down. The problem yeah. is, so no, the, the problem that they're having is uh, if Joe steps down, then Kamala Harris becomes president. And I don't, 
know if it's a legal thing, but then she has a claim to 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 run again. Mm -hmm. They're they're in a big they're in a really tough spot because Bobby Kennedy Jr. is on this side as well. So I, I think whoever's in that room, probably Mark Zuckerberg too. They're like, guys, <laughs> there's only so much money in the world that we can throw at this problem. <laughs> These are huge exactly. problems. Uh, I mean, Bobby Kennedy. <clears throat> what do you think about him? I think uh, I like him when it, when it, what he says. I agree with. But there's so much about him that I disagree with. Like he's a, I think he's a hardcore progressive. Like he, uh, if he came in, he would just, uh, granted, he'd get rid of the CDC and he'd strip the military budget. But I think everything else would get expanded, and I think he would have to give in to a lot of the demands on the left, like the LGBTQ stuff and education and uh, universal and basic income. For all the new green, he is, he is, like. Uh, he he might be staying quiet about it now, but he was very outspoken for environmental causes, no. you know, not too long ago. He also has a bit of a dark past, too, in terms of women and, um, I mean, yeah, okay. But he does have, he carries the Kennedy um, genes in that, in that sense of the word. And... Uh, it's totally possible that he's he's gonna <clears throat> he's gonna be on that list for Epstein if they if they release it. Um, it's <laughs> yeah, true. I wonder if he's gonna be on that list. Um, <laughs> I, I'm surprised they're releasing it. I'm surprised the judge is not. You know, they, they should whisk her away to like Guantanamo to keep her safe. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think that there's it, there's something else going on that that list is not going to come out. There's there's uh, there's too many people on it that uh, I mean we know Bill Clinton's on it. We know Hillary's on it. We know uh, you know that we know of a lot of people who are on it. It's it's the ones that we don't know that that you have to be interested in and and people are like oh well Donald Trump was has got to be on the list and that. <clears throat> Donald Trump, what people don't understand is the flight logs and the client list are two different things. The client list is who, who Epstein was able to blackmail and get in, in compromising uh, positions. The, the flight list means nothing. Donald Trump flew with with it, his daughter and his son on Epstein's plane. And Epstein flew on his plane. That's what happens with the rich and famous. It's not hard to absolutely stump us plebs here because we can't even imagine running in, the, in, in lifestyles of the rich and famous. They say Donald Trump partied with him. Uh, yeah, he was at a few places where, because all of the elites hobnob together. That's what they do. But that doesn't mean that Donald Trump was, uh, you know, he's a, a child molester. The thing about them saying that he, want, he said he wanted to have sex with his daughter. That is the stupidest thing. He said, my daughter's a beautiful woman. If I wasn't her father, I'd date her. That's what he said. What's wrong with that? Did, did you? I don't find anything wrong with that. If I, I wasn't, I kind of, her, she's beautiful. I'm. He's proud of her. I, I stopped um, focusing on the the individual incidents. It just it was too demoralizing. Um, but Harvard came out with a study of the bias in. Uh, this was like in 2019, I think. The bias of uh, media towards Donald Trump, and it was just off the charts. Like. Fox was the only one that was supportive, and, and they were like 56-something percent biased against them. The, the rest of them were like 80 percent biased. And then you get to Germany, it was like 98 percent biased against Donald Trump. Yep. And like th those numbers are just, they're embarrassing. He was, he was nominated for four Nobel Peace Prizes. Four. And Donald Trump? Yes, you didn't know that, did you? No. During his term, four nods for the Nobel Peace Prize. I never heard of that, but 
They would never give it to him, though, did they? No. He didn't win. He didn't even get a, anything. He They uh, gave it to Greta Thunberg, I think. She won one of them and some other... Uh, <clears throat> um, Michelle Obama just won uh, uh, an award in the music category for talking a book that she wrote. Well, she didn't write it. A, a, a ghostwriter wrote it. And she she spoke and read the book and spoke. And she won a fucking award for it. And Donald Trump... Donald Trump got world peace. He has the the uh, Middle East has not been. Uh, he he got them to sit down and talk to each other, and do, for the first time in history, in in you know forever, he actually went and visited Xi Jinping. Nobody nobody's ever been invited into that special garden, <clears throat> North Korea. He, you know, the little crazy dude, he shook hands with him. They had lunch. Nobody does that. He got four nominations for a Nobel Peace Prize and, and didn't win. Like, how that, in fact, I don't even know, has anybody ever gotten, maybe two, but I don't, I didn't know that four. And yet, honestly, I, I'm surprised that they even nominated him because. These I've come to understand these institutions. You're, it's almost like they're the you know they're children and they got their own toys and they won't let me play with their toys. That's yeah. how they are with these institutions. So yeah. uh, Nobel is obviously one. The United Nations is another one. The International Criminal Court, all the media like the Wall Street Journal and the CNN. It's just a tool for these people to use and 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 just keep promoting their lifestyle. So. Uh, I, I hate to get political on this one, but the reason I'm running for PPC and I'm not running for CPC, Conservative Party, is because I just I don't feel like if you play the game, you're ever going to win. So I think we need citizen led solutions. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I voted PPC last time. I, I couldn't do O'Toole. I, I just could not vote for him. I, I, I just I could see that he was giving up the election the same way Stephen Harper, because I watched Stephen Harper give that, that election up that year, that Trudeau won. He gave it up. He didn't even campaign. He was like Biden in the basement. He, he acted like he had it in the bag, and he lost the election on his arrogance, in my opinion. I said, who the fuck is Stephen Harper? Like, what the heck? And so I didn't, uh, uh, you know, Trudeau won, hands down. And then when I saw, uh, uh, well, Andrew Scheer, he didn't even have a chance. He, what, what was he in government for, what, two months? And then they booted him. And what did they boot him up over? He allowed his, he's got five kids, and he put them in private school, and, and they found that some of the fun, uh, his government fun, funding had been funneled into his children's, paying for his children's education. Oh my God. Like the worst thing in the world when we see what some of these other politicians are doing and they booted Shearer out over the over an ethics thing about his children and their education. And how many ethics violations now has Trudeau had? Five now? I don't even know. I can't. I lost count. And then I saw O'Toole run, and and I could just see him giving it up. He just gave. He was just giving it up. And and really, can you imagine? It must be, like, to to actually take on uh, what they, what he was going to have to take on. I could see him saying, you know what? I don't really want to win. It's just like a whole lot of, you know, <laughs> it's just a whole big hassle. And he, he basically, as far as I'm concerned, he gave it up. He threw the, he threw the bag in, his, in the ring that just, like, let them have it. I think, uh, so regarding his children, now, I don't know specifically how that allegation arose, but 
what's happening, I'm noticing they're complicating the the regulations and the legislation surrounding everything. And one of those things is running for office. So every, so seemingly every single person is breaking some rule at some point for campaign finance laws. Yeah. And all once if they want you out, they just unleash the, the army of lawyers. They use lawfare against you and they'll bog you down. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. Our mayor in West Vancouver, they're going after him because they're claiming that he that he cannot find the receipt for the secondhand couch that he purchased wow. for his HQ. And, and he's like, the couch is right there. It's not like he gave it to his mistress. The couch is there, but he can't produce the receipt. So so they, they launched this allegation at him. And then local media, North Shore News and even Global News, they pick it up. So... Uh, I don't care what global says. They might say, we're not lying. We're truthfully. No, you're lying. Like that's you're what you're doing is you're carrying out lawfare. You're coming out and you're pretending like you're a good Christian. You're a liar. <laughs> Go to hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's true. Um, that's just it. Like they, even with Pierre, they, they're, they have to have, you don't get to where you're going if they don't have something on you. They, they, you just don't. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what um, Maxime's problem is, why he can't get uh, on the ballot. I, I don't know what it is, because there seems to be plenty of, of uh, uh, support for him. But, but even in the last election, like I watched Rebel News for the election, because I, I won't watch the rest of the crap. I watched Rebel, and he predicted 11 percent. He predicted that there that we would get a let that PPC would probably come out with 11 seats. He said it's not a it's not a win, but it's it's good. 11 seats, zero zero seats. And even he he was like, I am shocked. I I don't even know what to say. It was like it was like down in the states, the red wave in 2020, yeah. and and just a nothing, a big nothing burger. And that then we had the purple wave up here, and nothing. So so that's what scares me is I I don't really feel like we have free and fair elections anymore. Well, I don't know as to the unfairness of the election. I just don't know. I haven't been following it here, like in the U.S. With respect to the red wave in the U.S., I think what happened is we we got cocky. So we, on the right, we just assumed that as things get worse and they get very bad, people will wake up. And they don't. They just don't. Like, no matter how expensive the food gets, the, like the, a loaf of bread, how expensive it gets, majority of people that vote for the Liberal Party because of the font and the logo for the Liberal Party and the nice red color, they'll keep voting for that. Yeah. So which ties, which brings me to the, your third point is why the PPC didn't get 11 seats. I think Canada is in a state of fear. So everyone I talk to, they say we love the PPC and we'd want to vote for him. But Trudeau is this big existential threat and we just can't risk it, which is kind of why I, I decided to run for the PPC. I figure maybe I can bring something to the table. I grew up in these big cities, I, so they can't say, you know, you're a fringe um, what do they call it? The unwashed masses. I am an immigrant, so they can't as easily call me a racist. And I figure if I do all of these things and maybe I can go to people and if I can convince them and say, listen, li like living in fear, you're not living, you're just surviving. Um, uh, that, that, that's, that'll be my contribution to the PPC if I can get, get one seat. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's, all, that's all it takes. You only okay. need one and then you've got representation and then from there you can move on. And, and I, I agree. I, like I say, I, I, like, I like what Maxine says. I, I like all of his stuff and, and as radical as it sounds, I like it. Because we're we need radical change right now. We need we need a, a an about face, like not just like a slow stop. We need to halt it now and reverse it. Mm -hmm. Throw it in reverse and head back down the highway, man. Because that's what we need. So I don't know. I don't even know what who I'm going to vote for. I I 
I go from wanting uh, Trudeau to have to get out, but then if they get somebody else in there that's a little bit more moderate, will that pick them back up again and get them back in? So may, I, I say to myself, no, go to the bitter end, Trudeau. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I hope he stays right into the end and just <clears throat> destroys yeah. the country. A silver lining, maybe people will finally wake up and realize the problem is not Trudeau. It's it's us. It's this government. It's a system yeah. that we've allowed to continue. Yeah, um, I, we're kind of approaching two hours, which is impressive. But I wanted to talk about one other thing, Pierre Polyev. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to say anything bad about him. I, I, the way I view it, the reason that he got the leadership position is because of that stunt he pulled where he stood up and he's like, how much, how much he did that? He kept asking Trudeau, how much? And, and then, so he, they put him in, but he can't answer, um, like he just doesn't know how to deal with the media. Like they come out and they call him a racist. So he, he kind of, oh, he says, all right, fine. Let's, let's, let's. Yeah, let's be quiet. Let's not say anything extreme. Christine Anderson comes. He's like, oh, well, she was a Nazi. So he's not like we gave him a mandate during that leadership race. We said we're, we're not happy with the way the country's going. We're giving you a first round win. And he was all raw, raw conservative. But not so much now. And I, I feel like if uh, Candace Bergen, Burgess, Bergen, Candace Bergen. Bergen, Bergen, if she had stayed, Candace Burgess, if she had stayed, I always thought she would have made a much better leader. Like she was more articulate. She was she was more seasoned. Um, she was she was more uh, photogenic. But um, like I wish the Conservative Party well, and I, I suspect they will pick up many seats if there's another election. <laughs> but that's my two yeah, cents. Exactly. <clears throat> I I I feel like. You're never going to make everybody happy all the time. So he's he's he does have a, a a a base that he has to he sort of has to keep happy. We, me, anyways. I'm I'm a little bit more radical. I'm I'm more out there. I want to see him say, uh, you know vaccines were wrong and I denounce the who and I, you know, I denounce, he's denounced WEF, but he, don't, he won't talk about it anymore. And I guess people just want to keep hearing him say it. Maybe that's what we, we need. And he's like, well, I've already said it. I've said it enough. The other thing I don't trust is I know he's, his wife was involved in, in the, the PCR test things. She was involved in it, and they've scrubbed it, and that makes me nervous. When they start, because they can scrub anything they want, but when they start scrubbing things, that that's it's not a good thing. Say it, say it for God's sake. Yeah, we she actually did believe in the PCR test, but now we know that it's wrong. Like just say this, say your shit, right? Don't don't continuously scrub it, lie, don't do that. Everybody ha makes mistakes in their lives. Everybody has a little bit of a fault. Um, and like I said, we're not the sum total of just one thing that we agree with. So I, to me, I just say to myself, I, <clears throat> I know that we have to get Trudeau out. Um, we, we just have to. What that will look like on the other side, will it be better? I, I, I would hope it would be a bit better. Um, but I, it probably isn't going to be everything that we hope for because he's one man and he has, he's running a party. Sure, he became the, 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 pr the prime minister, but he still has to answer to certain, certain things. And, and he cannot just say, nope, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. It, it, he can't do that, right? Even though Trudeau has done it, but he gets the support of his his liberal caucus behind him. I don't think that I don't think that if he was, went too radical, I don't think he'd have the support of the CPC anymore. I don't think he would. I think he would lose a lot of his base 
because they they've gone too too much left. He's in a tough position because if he goes left, he loses his base. If he goes right, the media pummels him. Yeah. No. At least with, <clears throat> and that's another thing about Maxine. He's got nothing to lose. He says he says it as he because he's got nothing to lose. You know, he's he isn't anywhere in the polls. He's one percent, and and he probably won't be allowed to debate or anything in the upcoming elections because he can't get a seat. I don't know. Can he can he go around the country and try and win another seat as? as uh, ridings come up. Um, it, Christy Clark did it. She won the Liberal and there wasn't a seat available for her, so she booted the guy in Kelowna out, bought a house in Kelowna, and she never even lived there. She lived in Vancouver in Point Grey, but but uh, she, needed a, she needed a riding, and so that's what they did for her. Well, time will tell. I guess so. Yeah, I guess um, I just I just say put your seatbelt on for twenty twenty four. It's going to yeah. be fun. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, uh, I guess uh, we'll get you back on the show in twenty twenty four, and uh, have a happy new year. And <laughs> you too. Have a happy new year. Thank you very much for coming on, Deb. <laughs>